Good morning, friends. My name is Paul Aiken, and I am Director of Music and Worship at the Cathedral of the Rockies. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. So whether you're joining us from here in Boise or from somewhere around the world, we sincerely welcome you to engage, to light a candle, and to join us in worship. Our call to worship this morning is inspired from the book of Micah. Would you please join me? God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Let us pray. It is good to be together, God, on these screens with these people, together listening for your voice, united by your spirit. In this time of worship, tell us about your kingdom of kindness so that we can see it. Show us your justice. We want to walk with you humbly, closely, daily. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is called The National Hymn. The text was written in 1876 by an Episcopal priest in Vermont. And the music we know today was penned in 1894. It was first included in the American Methodist Hymnal in 1905 and tells the stirring tale of how our history, fraught with challenges, will someday lead us into a place of peace. Let's sing, God of the Ages. Would you join me in this opening prayer this morning? Stir our spirits toward your righteousness, Lord. Move our feet along the road of justice. Open our hearts to love as you have loved us. And now let us pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I would ask you to engage your mind as we enjoy this gift of music together.
distance from the shadow into your radiance. is hope. We've been talking about this for weeks, and I hope this definition is beginning to just roll off your tongue more easily. Let's say it together. Hope is making someone's tomorrow better than today. We've talked about this for about four weeks now, so let me ask you a really pointed question. How have you made someone's tomorrow better than than today. See, preachers love it when you send messages that you got something out of the sermon today, but we love it even more when we see the message acted out by those that heard it. So I want to encourage you today. Would you post, if you're on Facebook, just post right there in the comments. Name a way that you have made someone's tomorrow better than today. It's not bragging. It's a way of sharing with us so we might replicate what you have tried so we could all inspire hope through our actions. Here's another way that we could ask the question. How have you lived into God's hopeful calling? We've all heard the old adage, love is an action, not a feeling, right? Well, that works with hope, too. How have you acted towards hope? Your answer is a response to a call from God. Friends, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. My name's Rob Walters. I'm one of your pastors. Pastor Dwayne is out of town this weekend. He'll be preaching again next weekend and joining us in the pulpit. I'm so glad to be with you at both of our campuses today. Thank you for being in worship. You know, that old adage of practice what you preach, it rings really true for preachers like me. I never try to challenge you to do something that I would not be willing to do myself. So in response to this challenge to make someone's day tomorrow better than today, I decided I would take a step too. You see, I serve God at my office all of the time. During the day and the evenings and the weekends, I serve God as a part of my vocation about my calling to ministry. I serve God on a regular basis. But the question is, would I be able to serve God more when I'm not at work in my own time? You see, this is something we have to work on as preachers. So about a month ago, when we were quite a ways into COVID, 
I began volunteering in my time off for the New York hospital system as a remote chaplain. My role is to visit with patients who are fighting COVID-19 and their family members who cannot have close contact with them at the time. Now, pastoral care, that's not new to me, but pastoral care on a TV screen, that's very new to me. You see, I see the pain, I see the hurt, I see the death, I see loneliness, and I see this stark shadow of distance when people can't be together at a time when they need to be together. But I also see a great deal of hope. I see it in the medical staff who serve because they want to make someone's tomorrow better than today. I see healing sometimes, and I see people connecting with God in brand new ways. I don't always know if I make someone's tomorrow better than today because they're walking through really hard, hard stuff. But I really try to answer that calling from God, not just at work, but away from work in my off time as well. Sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. But I find that there is a joy and a hope in those moments. And I know you do too, when you work to make someone's tomorrow better than today. I love our scripture story today because there is joy and hope in this story as well. We're studying the book of Esther, and the story begins this way. Let me set the scene for you. Esther is the wife of a Persian king. His name is King Osterhaus and also went by the name Xerxes. Now, Esther's cousin is Mordecai, who is in several parts of our scripture. Haman is the chief minister of the kingdom. He reports directly to the king, and he carried in him this racist bigotry towards the Jewish people of the time. He spoke to the king and said these words. He said, there is a certain people scattered and spread out among the people in all the states of your kingdom. Their laws are different, and they do not observe the king's laws. He goes to the king and he gets consent from the king to carry out the first holocaust, the killing of all the Jews ordered by the king. Now Mordecai is beside himself and goes to Esther and asks Esther to persuade the king to stop this tragedy from occurring. Interestingly enough, God is never mentioned in Esther never mentioned in the entire book, but the presence of God in the midst of oppression and hate is very real throughout all the pages of this book. I want to share with you just a couple specific verses. In chapter 4, verse 3, we read these words. Would you read them along with me at home? In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Can you imagine this moment? The Jews, stereotyped by a non-Jew, they are fighting for their very lives in the midst of oppression and hate and violence. Sackcloth and ashes were a sign of mourning in Jewish culture, so they would put on a sackcloth and cover their heads with ashes as a way of mourning this difficult time. In chapter 4, verse 8, we read this. How about we read together? Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. You see, Mordecai is determined to get Esther to do something, to take a concrete action with the king that could lead to hope for the Jewish people. Mordecai is effectively saying, hope is making someone's tomorrow better than today. Verse 11 goes on like this. Let's read together. All of the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. 
Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come in to the king for 30 days. Do you see what's happening here? Esther is afraid to take an action. Despite Mordecai's plea, Esther is scared. She doesn't want to go to the king without being summoned. This was a cultural role for women at the time. So the question I have to ask us is, do you ever feel afraid to challenge oppression and hate? If so, you're in good company with Esther. She struggled with the same moment. Verse 14, we read some of the most famous lines from the book of Esther. Let's say this together. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Esther hears the call, and she chooses to take action, even at the risk of her own death, to make someone's tomorrow better than today. She offers hope to Mordecai and to others, not just through her feelings of hope, but through her action to stop oppression from occurring. Consider these words for a moment. For if you keep silence at such a time as this— Yet in our world today, we find ourselves often silent, often scared, often unwilling to act when faced with moments of oppression and violence. Then there are those other words, perhaps you have come for just such a time as this. Another way to put that phrase might be like this, perhaps you have been called for just such a time as this. You see, we are all called in different ways. And the question I would ask you is to what action are you and I called by God today? What are we called to do to make someone's tomorrow better than today? Christians are also called for such a time as this. And the way that we offer hope is to act to make someone's tomorrow better than today. So I wanted to take us on a short walk through history of more recent times. We've seen oppression and violence in our world. We think back to things we learned in history classes like the Emancipation Proclamation that was issued in 1862 and the Civil War that would end in 1865. These were tangible ways of making someone's tomorrow better than today. But the question we have to ask is, did they work? Did it resolve the oppression and the racism taking place? You see what many of us often don't learn in our history classes, that shortly after the war, black codes came into place throughout the country. They were enacted by cities and counties and even states. And these laws required a person of color who was outside their home to prove that they had a job when requested. If they did not, they were forced into labor again. This was systemically enforced by counties and cities and states. This was oftentimes called the second slavery. So was it over? yet. Another photo that was taken around this time is this photo. It is Thomas Dartmount. His nickname was Daddy Rice. He was an actor that made famous the horrific phrase, Jim Crow. You see in this next photograph, we see after the Emancipation Proclamation, Rice was performing in this offensive black face. And he made a fortune in New York theaters and even in the White House while mocking disabled slaves. This type of racist acting would even launch the minstrel tradition of the late 1800s. And he used a terminology that was not new to people at the time. 
You see, this phrase, Jim, also meant Jimmy, which also meant crowbar or a way of breaking into something. The word crow was a derogatory term for persons of color that originated all the way back in the 1700s, but he would revive it. Later, this country would adopt the phrase Jim Crow laws to describe a set of laws that embodied systemic injustice and racism. You see, when I visit as a pastor with people about these hard topics of systemic injustice, sometimes people will say to me, but pastor, it's just a few bad apples rather than a systemic issue. After all, can you imagine mocking any disabled person, let alone a former disabled slave, and being invited into the White House to do it for pay? Daddy Rice was doing just that. One would have thought that making a fortune by doing this would have been challenged by someone for such a time as this, from the word semester, right? And to make it even worse, a a people called Methodists were around 150 years before any of this took place. In fact, most of the early Methodist churches still standing across the country today, they existed during this time. Where was the early church? Were they involved in systemic silence at the time? Another story that connected deeply with me this week as I prepared to visit with you today was that of John Henry Falk. Now, John Henry Falk was a graduate student in the 1930s and 40s, and he interviewed Americans who had been born into slavery. I'll be frank, this is hard to listen to. The voices of actual slaves from the plantations. Listen to the voice of Laura Smalley, She was 91 years old when this was recorded in the 1940s. Take a listen. Well, they taken that old woman, poor old woman, cat in the peach orchard, and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well. Looked like to me, I can't. And around the tree and whipped her. And, well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it it just had her clothes all down to her waist, you know. They didn't have a plum naked, but they had a clothes down to a waist. And every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. She snuff the pipe out on her. You, you know the embers in the pipe. I'm where you ever see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on her? Mm-hmm. Oh, Good Lord. Lord. Mm-hmm. In preparing for today's message, I listened to about 30 minutes of recordings by former slaves. I wanted to immerse myself in their words so as to amplify their thoughts and feelings today. Can you imagine people living in the 1940s still carrying the pain of racism within them each and every day, the pain of actual slavery? Hear the voice of Fountain Hughes, also recorded in the 1940s as he describes the relentless work on a Virginia plantation. The night never come out. You had nothing to do. Time to cut tobacco. If they want you to cut all night long out in the field, you cut. And if they want you to hang all night long, you hang, you hang tobacco. It didn't matter about your tired being tired, you're afraid to say you're tired. You're too afraid to say you're tired. I find those words haunting when I listen to them. For me, the 1940s, it seems so late after the Civil War. It seems like more recent history. It seems like the effects of slavery would not still have been felt in society. But maybe that's my own bias and my own privilege talking. Many decades later, in 1979, Falk was interviewed just before his own death. Here's how he described his own epiphany, this awakening of what it means to make someone's tomorrow better than today. I was sitting out on a wagon tongue with this old 
black man and was telling him what a different kind of white man I was. I remember him looking at me very sadly and kind of sweetly and condescending and said, you know, you still got the disease, honey. I know you think you're cured, but you're not cured. You can't give me the right to be a human being. I'm born with that right. Now, you can keep me from having that. If you've got all the policemen and all the jobs on your side, you can deprive me of it. But you can't give it to me. Because I was born with it just like you was. And my God, it had a profound effect on me. I was furious with him. But the more I reflected on it, the more profoundly it affected me. And I realized this was where it really was. You see, we seem to think the pain of bigotry is over, but I want to amplify the question that he was asked, do you still have the disease? It's a question that each of us have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves each and every day in how we encounter others and how we think and feel. Do you still have the disease? The argument in the mid-1900s was that slavery was long gone, that its systemic effects were over. Listen to these former slaves talk about life after freedom. Tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can. We've been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave, sister was a slave. Father was a slave. They know nothing about reading right now. All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your missus. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after she was gone, just, saw, just like he turned some out, you know, didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to go. And by this point, the Methodist church was over 200 years old and we were still seeing systemic racism in the world. When I hear her say, I didn't know where to go, I want to ask, go to the church. Where was the church in that moment? Maybe we were called for such a time as this. Not only are Christians individually called for such a time as this, but entire denominations are as well. We are called to offer hope by making someone's tomorrow better than today. So recently, I've been asking myself the question, what does the Lord require of the United Methodist Church in such a time as this today? What does the Lord require of you and of me and of this denomination and the church that we love in the midst of our world today? You see, by the time of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the issue of racism in the church itself had been a very predominant one. In 1780, just shortly after the beginning of a people called Methodist, churches were burying persons of color with inscriptions like this one. This was found on 77-year-old Caesar's grave. Here lies the best of slaves now turning into dust. Caesar, the Ethiopian, craves a place among the just. His faithful sh should has fled to realms of heavenly light, and by the blood that Jesus shed is changed from black to white. Just to read that phrase is disgusting. It was in to this culture that people thought that black was wrong and white was right, that Methodism was born. The people that you and I would become were embedded into this culture from the very beginning, called to make a difference. All the way back to 1784, well before emancipation as a nation, the Methodist Episcopal Church was founded. But then watch what happened. In 1816, the African Methodist Episcopal Church was formed in Philadelphia as a direct response to racism within the church itself. Then in 1821, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church was formed in New York, again over the topic of racism, not just in the world, but in the church itself. In 1845, the Methodist Episcopal Church South was formed in Kentucky, again over the topic 
of racism inside the church. And in 1939, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church would all unite to form the Methodist Church. But catch this, persons of color were not brought in. They were segregated into the Central Conference in 1939 within the body of the church. Here's a map showing you what the Central Conference structure looked like. This was 1939, and the church is struggling deeply with the issue of racism. It would be 1956 before church legislation allowed black Central Conference churches to join the other conferences instead. 1956. Did you catch that? 1956. Seems very late for the church to be coming to the table. Do you see the systemic nature of racism, not just in society, but even in the churches that you and I have come to love? I want to share with you this photo of Duke Divinity School. It's a gorgeous, beautiful space and a wonderful seminary today. But back in that time period, even our seminaries that were training pastors in the middle of the 1900s were prohibiting persons of color, even after separate but equal was deemed unfair. The Reverend Gilbert Caldwell, who was a black pastor, applied to Duke in 1954 and received this response. Your application to Duke Divinity School has been rejected because Duke's policy denies admission to Negroes. We hope you will find a seminary to meet your needs. So as a church in the 1950s, we were struggling with issues of systemic racism, not just in the world, but within our seminaries and our churches at the same time. And what year did we open a brand new, beautiful cathedral in Boise, Idaho? 1960, right during the middle of this time period. Then in 1965, Reverend Caldwell would be pictured here on the right of the photograph with Reverend Virgil Wood in the center and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the left. They were standing on the top of a Boston school working for justice after he had been denied admission into a seminary. This is a moment of redemption. He found a different seminary, one in Boston that would welcome him and he could go to school to become a pastor. But we wonder why so many decades later, so many of our churches that are predominantly white are rarely ever served by a black pastor. It was not until recent years that we even started offering training in our seminaries. You see, racism is not just an issue in the world, it's an issue within us and within our churches. For such a time as this, you have been called. My grandfather, Bob White, was a pastor in the 1960s. When the Methodist Church merged with the Evangelical United Brethren Church, he was there in 1968 when the two denominations came together and racism was a key point somewhere in this photograph my grandfather sits. Racism was a predominant conversation for these early Methodists like my grandfather. You see, even the sign that my grandfather would have walked by as he came to the conference said, wanted an inclusive church now. It was the topic of conversation for clergy and laypersons like my grandfather at the time, take a listen back to what it was like when the church was born. There are specific issues coming before the conference, um, race and riots, war and peace, ecumenism, and yet I think apart from these and beyond them is the much broader and more important issue of whether the church, both in the local congregation and through its larger official structures, is going to relate to the revolutions that are a part of our moment of time. I think it's the responsibility of the church to gear itself up to be a part of God's activity in this world. 
the real issue we are facing at the Uniting Conference has to do with uh, racism and the fact of whether or not we're going to deal with it adequately. Uh, let me say that there are a number of us who hope that by the persuasion and coercion and pressure that we can bring to bear, that we can sensitize the minds and eyes and hearts of people by which they can then, in fact, take a decisive action in regards to making this a racially inclusive church. That was the time frame into which my young grandfather was a pastor. But two generations later, doesn't it sound familiar? Race and riots, war and peace, ecumenism working with other religions. Then there was the much more broad and important issue that you heard them talk about. Will the church relate to the revolutions that are a part of that moment in time, the time of people like my granddad, the time of those who helped build the stone cathedral in which many of us worship today? Then you heard in the video, he said, it is the responsibility of the church to gear itself up to be a part of God's activity in this world. I know phrases like that inspired my grandfather as he shared those with me later in life. But the question I have to ask you is, after all that church history, are you and I ready to relate to the revolutions that are a part of this moment in time today? Are we ready? I pray the answer is yes. I would also ask you, are we ready to gear ourselves up two generations after my granddad? Are we ready to gear ourselves up to be a part of God's activity in the world right now today? Maybe God is in the midst of what is happening and is our call to respond to that activity. I pray the answer is yes. Friends, from biblical times, people like Esther, a Jewish female, were called by God to confront oppression. And in early Methodism, churches merged and divided and merged and divided over these very important issues of racism. Well, many years later, in 2008, the Reverend Caldwell, that couldn't even get into a seminary because of the color of his skin, would eventually speak at the 2008 General Conference of the United Methodist Church to share some of his powerful story of racism in society and racism in the life of the church. And today, in 2020, two generations after my granddad, our churches are still struggling with issues of racism, sexism, ageism, and all of the other isms that follow that. We have churches that will not welcome a female preacher still today. We have churches that will not welcome preachers of color into predominantly white churches. We have churches who will not welcome those who are LGBTQIA to be married and to be ordained and to live into the calling that God has placed in their lives in 2020. Friends, there's much work still to do. This weekend is a special weekend for me. I start my fourth year this weekend as one of your pastors, and I have to tell you it is a great joy to be here in the midst of COVID-19 and walk this journey side by side with you. And I have to tell you that as I start my fourth year, I love this church because not only was I called here to be a pastor, but because I believe that we are ready as a church to challenge each of these places of oppression. That we together are ready to gear ourselves up to be a part of God's activity happening here today. See friends, it's just like the banner behind me. Love your neighbor who doesn't look like you who doesn't think like you, who doesn't love like you. Love your neighbor who doesn't speak like you or pray like you or vote like you. Love your neighbor. No exceptions. Friends, I believe that's the church we are and that we are called 
to be in the midst of the revolutions today, and that we are called to be a part of God's activity that is happening right now, not to shrug it off after generations of others, but to truly engage today for such a time as this, my friends, you were called. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we are humbled to be the church. We are humbled to receive your calling, to live into our membership vows, to stand against oppression and injustice in all forms that they might present themselves. God, we follow in a long line of people who are deeply committed to that promise, who have deeply tried to be a part of the revolutions of the time and to gear ourselves up to live into your activity. God, but God, we know that through generations, we have not done our best work. God, inspire us today. Light a fire inside of us as I, two generations after my grandfather, follow in those footsteps. God, light a fire inside of us to transform the world by transforming ourselves so that we might be truly bring an end to oppression, to racism, to sexism, to ageism, and all of the other isms in this world. God, bring us to the table to see the revolutions in our society. And God, call us to gear ourselves up to be a part of what you are calling to do for such a time is this. It is in your holy name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, friends, this is a time in worship that we give our gifts to God. Your gifts matter. They make a difference. They help us work against oppression in the world. You have fed uh, hundreds of people with grocery gift cards. You've offered child care to children that need it. You have worked so hard to make a difference in the community around us by offering classes and discussions. Right here at the Amity campus, right behind me, behind this banner, you've started a brand new food pantry where you're feeding over 100 families a month. You're making a difference with your gifts. So we're going to place on the screen uh, the opportunity for you to give online. We want to invite you to do that online or just to mail a check to either one of our campuses. And when you give, you transform the world. So we invite you to give and to give generously. Thank you for your gifts. As true 
results. Focus in. We have an amazing announcement for you. It's all about Virtual Vacation Bible School. Virtual Vacation Bible School is heading your way July 20th through the 23rd. And I know what you're thinking. I already homeschooled. I don't want to do the virtual thing again. But here's why you should. Every kid who registers is going to get a bag of supplies. It'll have craft projects, games, even snacks for every day. You'll receive a daily email that has worship songs and our Bible story. Plus, we have a Zoom session made especially for your kiddos. Yeah. And here's the best part for you adults. Happy hour with Pastor Debbie. That's right. A nightly nightcap and recap. If you have questions, if you had a horrible day or a fantastic day, we'll be there as a community to celebrate with you, to work through details, and to make your week great. So sign up at cathedraloftherockies.org today. Your kids will be jumping for joy. I'm coming to vacation Bible school. Hi, my name is Eric Whistle. I'm one of the youth directors here at Cathedral of the Rockies. We offer a variety of programming options for students in grades 7 through 12. In addition to special events throughout the year, we meet at least twice a week, all year round. During these days of shelter in place, we've been meeting on Wednesday evenings for a Zoom video session at 7 p.m. We'd love for you to join us. If you'd like to, please check out the link in our social media posts. In the summer, we get together on Tuesdays for something we call RAD, Read, Apply, and Discuss. Now, we normally meet in a local coffee shop, so this year we're trying something a little bit different. We're going to meet in person for a socially distanced RAD in the park. We're going to meet from 10 to 11 in the morning every Tuesday at Fairmont Park. So come join us. We're going to spread out at least six feet apart. We'll talk about our faith, talk about our week, and get to see real life people. We'd love to have you. Check out our Instagram and Facebook for more information. Friends, it's been a great joy to be here with you in worship today. I want to thank you for letting me spend these few moments to share some words with you today. Would you receive this benediction? As you go forward into the world, keep your eyes open to the revolutions that are happening right in front of us. As you go forward into this world, seek to answer the call of God in our lives, to see the activity that God is doing right now with our eyes open and our hearts ready to act. As you go forward into this world, find hope by making someone's tomorrow better than today. Because for such a time as this, you have been called. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen.